If you plan to go back in time to stop patient zero from catching COVID-19, be careful. I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, there's a big story out of the University of Queensland where a student uh, writing with a professor um, has a paper that is titled Reversible Dynamics with Closed Time-Like Curves and Freedom of Choice. And allegedly, this student, Jermaine Tobar, and his professor working with Professor Fabio Costa, has figured out the time travel paradox. And, and and I am not up on this stuff, I'm sure you are. So let me just kind of in very elementary terms describe to our viewers the time travel paradox. If you go back in time with an, in an attempt to stop patient zero from catching uh, COVID-19, under the old paradigm, if you prevent the pandemic, then you're going to eliminate the inspiration for you to go back in time to prevent the pandemic. And so it happens or it doesn't happen, or in any case, it's a paradox. Under the right. new paradigm, if you go back in time and try to prevent patient zero from catching COVID-19, you may become patient zero. In essence, there's still local autonomy of decision-making in that time, but there's a sense of determinism about where the track of history is going. So one way or another, the pandemic happens, but you may implicate yourself in the process. <laughs> Uh, are you following me so far, Bill? I am, yeah. So, uh, go ahead. Well, to me, to be honest with you, and, and I love this kind of thing, it's always fascinating to get kind of the theoretical underpinnings because time is the great mystery. None of uh, many, many cases in advanced physics, time just doesn't make any sense. Uh, it seems pretty clear that that what we perceive as time is our travel is our third dimensional world traveling through the fourth dimension and, and time is essentially a, a distance um, that we cannot perceive. Uh, so time is, is, is very odd. It's built into the structure of the universe. We call it space time for a number of reasons. Here's the thing about this. It, it, it strikes me as, as fascinating discussion, but ultimately to me, this sounds like one of those discussions about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin because it is academic, and I, I think it always will be. One of the things that uh, that I've been uh, dealing with uh, on some side work in all of my vast amounts of free time is uh, is trying to find a loophole for faster than light travel for a science fiction project, and the loophole's not there no matter how much I want to believe it. And and I what I what I bring from that is. Is that there are is that nature puts certain constraints on our behavior, and that these constraints are intolerable to us from an emotional point of view. We want to be able to get in the, the uh, Starship Enterprise and push the uh, button and get wherever we want to go whenever we want to go there, but the universe says no, and there's no way around it. Same thing for time. We always constantly obsess by the idea of being able to go back and fix something, but it 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 it, it seems to be impossible in the same way that the speed of light cannot be exceeded. It's built into the structure of things. You know, my thought was, and, and by the way, there's a lot of math involved in this, but because I was a journalism major, I can't tell you anything about that. But uh, you can read the article and we'll post it at BillWhittle.com. Uh, initially, I saw it in Popular Me Mechanics, but it was referencing a, uh, the paper in Classical Quantum, Classical and Quantum Gravity. Uh, unfortunately, my subscription to Classical and Quantum Gravity ran out in February and I have I was on the cover in, in March. You, yeah, you missed it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, but here's what I thought. I thought, what if this guy, Jermaine Tobar, is actually a traveler from the future coming back and just trying to scare us by saying, be careful, you might be the guy who actually starts the pandemic, or you might be the guy who launches Hitler's political career. Well, he does, if I understand this theory correctly in the 30 seconds of it that I've had explained to me by a guy who's not good at math, uh, <laughs> and, and, and neither am I, uh, then basically what he seems to be saying is that if you try to go back and change the, the course of history, the course of history will change you, and history is going to go on pretty much the way it, it wants to go on. And that's an interesting argument. There's always this discussion that the, the classic, classic, classic example of time travel is, boy, I wish I had a time machine so I could go back and, and kill you know, baby Hitler. And since Hitler hadn't done anything yet, you'd just be a guy who walked up and just, you know, shot a baby. Uh, <laughs> but, but a random baby. But, but the, uh, the, but the bigger question is, 
if Hitler had been struck by a car, which did not need to be uh, driven by a time traveler, if he'd just been killed uh, after his time in Landsberg prison, let's say, or any time really up until 1939, if he'd just been killed, no, better back at the beginning, if he had been killed in the early 20s, would World War II have happened because so much of that was Hitler, or would another person arise out of the, the just the incredible angst and desperation of Germany between the wars? That's the question. Because he World was War essentially II just the head of the pimple. Everything was building up under the derma that was going to explode somewhere anyway. That That is the question. Now, the question, and certainly it would be slightly different with somebody else, but the question is, could anybody else have done it? Hitler had a unique set of, of, of skills on the way up. He had a, a tremendous set of skills, one of the most mesmerizing speakers ever to live. So if Hitler had just been hit by a car um, in the early 20s, would Nazism have ar uh, arisen? And this is the great debate. This is the great man theory of history. If it would, would Britain have um, survived World War II without Winston Churchill if he'd never been born? It's, it's, it's not something that could be answered, but I tend to- Some other to, guys I, giving the same speech and the crowd's heading for the exits. <laughs> well, it's not the, some other guy giving the same speech. It's that if that all the other guys were giving a speech that said we should surrender now while he's still not angry at us. That's what the, that's what the politicians in Britain were basically um, counseling once France fell. So it, I, I tend to be, uh, I, I certainly, respect and understand that the, that the men in history, the great man theory of history, those men are the result of enormous societal pressures that push them to the fore. But I don't know if some of these events would have happened without them. Which reminds me of a, of a, a headline, I think it was a, in, in between the wars, I wanna say it was at Eton, might have been at Oxford. Uh, journalism school there was was having a competition to see who could write the most um, provocative headline. And the winner was, uh, this would be in the 1920s or 30s. And the winner was um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand found alive, World War I fought by mistake. <laughs> and, um, and that's a good indication of the opposite. That's a good indication of the, of the fact that World War I was gonna happen, whether it had been touched off by Franz Ferdinand being assassinated in Sarajevo, or some other thing, but but those pressures, those tectonic pressures were building. So it's it, it's fun to speculate, but nobody really knows. Well, it's interesting when you say it's fun to speculate. I mean, clearly this is not only a problem to which Jermaine Tobar and Fabio Costa exerted their uh, somewhat substantial uh, mental uh, acuity, but it's many, many other scientists and mathematicians have pondered this question with great seriousness and labored mm -hmm. over it in ceaseless hours of, in some cases, uncompensated toil in order to solve this question. What do you think it is, Bill, about this idea of determinism versus freedom of choice that makes people uh, is crazy? I mean, this, he's, he's laboring at something which he probably knows what you said, which is it doesn't really matter in the long run. Well, it, when I say it doesn't really matter, I don't mean to, to dismiss the importance of what he's doing and the importance of other people who've talked about things like building a warp drive and, and, all the, and wormholes and all the rest of it. Wormholes exist, the ability to warp space exists, uh, the theoretical idea of time travel exists. The problem is, is that we're big creatures made out of matter and we can't fit through any of those tiny little holes. Uh, the um, You can look at a, a positron as an electron that is moving backwards in time. So. Anything that we do to understand time better helps us enormously in our understanding of physics on, on the quantum level and maybe even on the, on, the, on the mega level. But there doesn't seem to be any indication that humans will be able to ever actually get in a machine and do this, the same for, for the faster than light travel. So why is it such a big, uh, a big obsession? Well, this obsession for faster than light travel is the obsession to see new worlds. So we're not, not just rocks with craters on them, a place where you can take your helmet off and. Here we go, here's a new planet. Uh, it's that sense of discovery and the urge for discovery that's built into us as a species. It's what, it's what pushed us out across the entire planet and we still carry that, that uh, genetic um, propensity. And likewise for time travel, we, we 
as we develop consciousness uh, over the uh, millennia, it, be it became clear to us that our actions would have a big effect. And when something went wrong, it's pretty easy to go back and look at something that happened, something you did or something that somebody else did, and you're able to, in your mind, say, if, if only that one thing hadn't happened, then all of this catastrophe wouldn't have happened either. Well, this and would so, really change Monday morning quarterbacking, wouldn't it? This would indeed. Uh, so so th th this is a good thing to close on. So imagine that time travel is possible and that each team has a time machine on the sidelines. Uh, a guy gets out there and throws, a throws an interception, at which point they say, whoa, 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 whoa. So we go back, uh, you know, Patriots throw an interception. So they get in their time machine, go back in time before the play. Now they do a running play. And it scores a touchdown. But now the defensive team says, well, whether well, they scored a touchdown, they just ran through us. So we're going to go back in time and we're going to block the run. Now, the reason all this is actually interesting, and by happy coincidence, I, I read this last night, a science fiction author, and who's, and I don't remember his name, I just stumbled on this yesterday by weird coincidence, said that if time travel is possible, and forgive me for not remembering his name, he said, if time travel is possible, then eventually so many time travel machines will be invented in so many universes and go back and change so many different pathways in, in so many different timelines that eventually the only universe that will remain stable will be the one universe in which a time machine was never invented. In other words, it's all about uh, And everybody will want to move there. there. <laughs> I, I will say this, Scotty. There are times, there are times when you know the, the classic science fiction trope is that is that you live in a in a good world. You desire there's a time machine. Let's go back. What could possibly go wrong? Sound of thunder about the guy going to hunt a T Rex is a classic example. So we live in this wonderful world. This is the trope. We go back in time. Something happened, changes the timeline, and now the world that we live in is much, much, much worse. It's a it's a it's a dystopia based on what I did as a time traveler. Many times in the last uh, 10 years or so, I felt like we're living in the dystopia, like this is, this is the screwed up timeline, you know? That the, that the timeline we should have been on before somebody went back and screwed things up, we'd have nuclear powered, you know, uh, desalination plants throughout the uh, state of California. And, and you'd have a thorium and, reactor in your backyard. Yeah. I think uh, if you are watching this right now and you're thinking about traveling back in time and doing something about the COVID-19, don't try to stop patient zero from doing it. Just try to get the Chinese government and the WHO to acknowledge it early on. And then we'll <laughs> still have a pandemic. It just won't be as bad. It's, yes, for you time travelers out there, I would recommend that you take Scott, uh, Scott Ott's uh, profoundly wise advice. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many people who in the past have joined Bill Whittle right here at BillWhittle.com and become Did members. They? In the future, others mm -hmm. may do the same, and I am predicting that you may become one of them. Why don't you go ahead and do that so I'll feel better about myself. For Bill Whittle, <laughs> I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.